Hey, this is Phil Better from the podcast Invest in Yourself, the Digital Entrepreneurs Podcast. Have you ever wanted to be an entrepreneur? Have you heard about all those kids making money on the internet? Do you want to start making money on the internet? Go to investinyourselfpod.com, subscribe, and listen as I interview people who have actually made money online. Listen to me, create a business, and see if I can succeed. Catch new episodes every Tuesday at investinyourselfpod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me is this guy who just kind of showed up on a Zoom meeting one time and has been there for, like, almost a year at this point, I guess. I don't know. Send him some emails as to how I can maybe approach him. Hey, his name is Mackenzie. How are you? I'm not actually in the Zoom meeting. I just broke into his house one day, and I won't leave. Yeah. I I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt and be like, hey, it's a bit more distance, but you know, you just leaned right into it. Yep. I'm breathing over his shoulder right now. <laughs> Let's talk literature. Yeah, really. <laughs> Before we get into it, obviously, you can support the show through Patreon, through PayPal, through the recommended reading page. We even have some dumb apparel that you can check out that I'm playing around with. Ooh, All actually. that's in the description below. We'll Jesus. We'll talk about it at the end of the show if you want to know more. So today, we're approaching a bit of a, you know, a harsher topic than we've been covering over the past few episodes, and we're going to be doing an episode based on Black History Month, right? Now, before we get too deep into the conversation, I think we both want to address this right off the bat. We are not black guys. Far from it. We're pretty white, (laughs) as far as 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 things go. Do not, we cannot speak. And we do not speak for the experiences of what we are reading about and discussing. And if we do end up saying something, we are very sorry about that. We right. apologize. And just to apologize ahead of time because we're both kind of dumbasses. And like, tell us. If, if we like, <laughs> send us an email about it, honestly, I'll be happy yeah. to read it. We want to get better. We, that's, we'll talk about it later in the show, but we need to get better and we need to, have, we need to be willing to face and own up to the mistakes we say. Mm-hmm. And so, like, we're, t- today's episode is less about, obviously, because as Mackenzie just said, the, <laughs> how people lived through these experiences, in this case, being an African-Canadian person in the 1840s, 50s, right? And more just about the general context and the, ari- uh, the arising of a Black Canadian literature in these early days, right? Mm-hmm. That's pretty much what we're going to talk about. Why it emerged, how it emerged, what forms did it take? That's the point of this episode right we make no claims to speak for the lived experiences of these people at all i think that's the I most we that we can much, say yeah that's that we want to say all right well with every apology that we can make out of the way let's get into it so i think the best place to start like, is as an overview or a context of slavery in british north america right or in canada or new france depending on where you are in the timeline <laughs> I've already done a whole episode on it way back in episode six or seven, where we talked about Lawrence Hill's uh, famous novel, Someone Knows My Name. But, you know, I think it's still useful to have at least a brief idea of what that history was and what it entailed, which will then lead us into how it's addressed in Canada by and large, right? Especially through literature or especially in how that history is perpetuated. So just kicking us off, There's no easier way to say this. Black slavery dates back in Canada all the way back to New France, right? As soon as there were Europeans here, there was black slavery, right? They immediately took people Mm -hmm. from Africa and brought them to the Caribbean colonies, to the North American colonies, and it pretty much perpetuated throughout New France and into British North America, right? Um, In New France, though, the first documented black person was actually not a slave, according to many uh, sources. He was a freeman who was probably captured initially, but eventually got his freedom. And his name was Metzer de Costa, which is a uh, the the actual pronunciation of that varies depending on which language you're in. But for our purposes here, it's Metzer de Costa. And he was a black person who was apparently brought to New France alongside Champlain as a translator. Because apparently he could not only speak French, but he apparently could speak also Dutch and maybe a few native languages, right? Which made him particularly useful for the French who were colonizing the area. That's how it works. The first documented one is the key word in that situation, documented. Because as we know, it's very likely that there was most likely many undocumented with them. This one was only documented because he was a free person first and foremost. 
And then second, because he had some sort of use and job as a polylinguist. Yes, totally. There would have been, well, there would have been a point, but only insofar as it was considered cargo to document the slaves, right? Yeah. <laughs> so horrible reality of that. There's not much to say about Maitre de Costa in general, just because we know very little about his early life, right? Yeah. He himself, uh, as far as I know, never wrote down anything about himself. And what we do know is through second or third hand accounts and vague sources that we have left over from the 17th century. So very little is known about him outside of that. Keep that in the back of your mind. I'm going to circle back to that point of we don't know a lot. Yes, that's a very, it's foreshadowing. Un unplanned foreshadowing right there. I'm just going to draw this big number four and stick it in some shadows for later. <laughs> so yeah, as, as I just mentioned, this practice of slavery obviously continued with the British, right? The North Atlantic slave trade that we've mentioned more than once on this episode is one that you know, is pretty much par for the course for the British at this point, right? And as soon as they took over in Canada, that was just a reality. Now, specifically within a Canadian context, there were pretty early on in the 18th century already some attempts to limit or abolish slavery in the 18, early 1800s, namely in Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick. And, you know, while the slave trade was a reality, the actual concept of abolition of slavery dates back long before the British took over, right? Oh, for it, sure. It just wasn't actually put into practice, but there were some abolitionist movements that date back to like the 1700s. You can track that with a lot of historical figures, you know, a lot of, even in the States, as far back as pre-revolution, there was talks and people writing papers about abolition. Mm -hmm. It was only, the problem was it took a long time for these things to gain traction just because of We've talked, I'm pretty sure we've mentioned and talked about this before, what's known as the triangle trade. Yes. This was the dominant economic format for a very long time, which is one of the leading factors why abolition movements were so slow, because it was the most profitable. Exactly, right? And that's, you see that also, not just with, uh, with, with slavery, although that's what we're talking about, right? But you see that with all kinds of social movements is that they, while they may have a popular base, right? Or at least they have a significant base, those in power are often the ones that are perpetuating the injustice, right? And, yeah. that, have a, and, and that benefit from its existence. So yeah. it'll take a while before these changes actually occur. It takes, it takes a lot for also, for a lot of time that popular base has to have the motivation to stand up to, to stand up against these systems that have been put in place. Yeah. We saw this again earlier this year, or, or back in 2020, when Black Lives Matter was in a fever pitch. You know, these things were starting to happen because we, our feelings of either guilt, blame, or doubt outweighed any feelings of comfort that we had of just ignoring the situation. Yes. So if we... If we look at it from a more chronological perspective, so the British take over in the 1760s. America goes through its revolution, obviously, in 1776. And one of the main tenets of this revolution is the right for slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And by the time, uh, by this point in the British Empire, as we were mentioning, abolition movements are pretty powerful, if not, uh, in, if not enacting profound change. Mm -hmm. But in the 1780s, as part of a way to make, as part of a way to gain traction, gain power, a big part of uh, the British tactic in the uh, in the American Revolution was to say, okay, well, these people who want to stay within the British Empire are given certain freedoms or are given certain property rights, right, including black people, right, and that's where you get in the 1780s uh, what we call the Black Loyalists, right? which again I covered a bit in episode six or seven. But this idea of, hey, these Black people will get their freedom and a piece of land, in this case in Nova Scotia mostly, if they decide to leave America and come to the British colonies. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing with the Loyalists, except obviously you had the extra added bonus of being made free, right? You're no longer a slave. <laughs> this obviously doesn't stop people from being victim of racism or segregation, right? That's a whole other ball game, but at least you're free in the eyes of the British system. Great. Is this the, sorry, act to limit slavery? Is this the one we were? It's coming just after, right? So okay. in 1793, exactly, there is a significant advancement in terms of abolition. And that is what Mackenzie just mentioned, right? The act to limit slavery in upper Canada. And basically what that says is, People who are born to slaves, or uh, yeah, black people who are born to slaves, 
are not slaves. They're born free. So basically you start eliminating slavery from a generational standpoint, right? The people who are already slaves are, they, they remain slaves. The slavery is not abolished as a thing, but at least their children are born free. They are given more of a chance. The only issue then being that they are born free, but then their parents are slaves. So therefore they have no way to sustain them. Exactly. So it's a small victory, but one that's ultimately very hollow. Mm -hmm. In 1807, you'll have one of the one that's often quoted, right? The Slave Trade Act, which, you know, abolishes exactly what it says it abolishes, <laughs> right? The trade mm -hmm. itself is no longer accepted. You can no longer actually send slaves across the Atlantic into various colonies. And, you know, that's just another way in which the slave, the institution of slavery is progressively limited. Right. Still slaves in Canada, but <laughs> at least you can't get new ones. Yeah, no, it's the, it's it's an important distinction to make mostly because it limits the fact that new it's a lot of these acts are for now about eliminating new production, which was probably the move that they were trying to look for of trying to limit a perpetuation of the cycle and starting something new. Yes, exactly. And for all intents and purposes, like it did accomplish quite a bit, not completely, but it did accomplish quite a bit in that progressively in Lower Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the actual practice would kind of die out, right? As, as the kind of pool of resources from which slave owners could pull is, well, the, the well literally ran dry in this case. Uh, you, you, as you mentioned, you cut off the production or you cut off the ability to acquire new slaves. You're basically just making the practice of it almost moot at that point or increasingly moot. Part of that also is helped by a lack of legal support, right? Not only was the mentality kind of going by the wayside within the British societies, but there were increasingly less laws that could actually help perpetuate these things. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to say, again, you're seeing more of that shift more and more of industrial revolution kicking in. And so the raw materials and that sort of stuff, the economic base is changing as the times go by. Yeah. Economic base is changing. Same with the shape of colonialism and so on and so forth. Britain is, Britain lost the states, which was their major holding as their major foot in North America. Obviously, Canada is still important to them, but you can start to see there's a move less and less away from taking all these resources from colonies, which they're starting to realize isn't as feasible as these colonies themselves start to rebel more and more. Yep. And their, their focus becomes more internal resource harvesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Unfortunately, just to clarify that this is reality of what happened and not so much the idealistic goal of people got better. The, the final kind of, not the final, but in terms of slavery, where slavery is concerned, the kind of final nail in the coffin of slavery uh, comes in 1834, right? At least officially, because of course it's not going to solve every problem. But in 1834, there is what's called the Slavery Abolition Act, which takes effect across the British Empire and essentially eliminates slavery. You slavery no as in that form in that Again, form indentured servitude still exists today in a oh, bunch yes. of other factors oh yes that's exactly it there's all kinds of ra racial segregation which yep. become very legalized right there are overt policies that make that possible as you say indentured servitude is a thing there's all kinds of other ways in which oppression happens for black people and all kinds of other minority ethnic groups, minorities right? but in terms of like the, the recognized form of slavery as it was known for the past 200 years in Canada, that's when it kind of comes to an end. Mm -hmm. right? By that point in British North America, it was estimated that there were about 50 slaves left. Um, and with that, they were freed. Right? Ooh, great. great. How are their wages doing? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. How is their educational opportunities? Well... Hey, segue. Segue. Do, 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 do. Not entirely non-existent as some people would think right mm -hmm. <laughs> that and, and this kind of comes back to this idea of segregation that i that i just mentioned right is that like many people in canada or british north america there was an increasing push for the idea of public schools and public education right mm -hmm. so education financed by the state and this was no different for black communities although they did have access to less resources, certainly, right? I'm not going to romanticize this. They had access to less resources and they were segregated, but mm -hmm. they did have their own systems of education, right? 
And as we're going to be talking about throughout this episode, they had their own networks of communication. They had literary networks. So even if it wasn't in necessarily officialized forms, right, or officialized structures as we'd recognize it in education today, the idea of uh, knowledge perpetuation was definitely present within African community, African Canadian communities within British North America, a hundred percent. Do you think like I just went over basically where we did went over two hundred and fifty yeah. years of slavery, right, in fifteen minutes or so, <laughs> and I I selectively chose like these moments because. As you mentioned before the episode, right before we started recording, we hear. Oh yes, my question. Yeah, can I ask it again? Yeah, go go for it. Patrick, did you learn any of this in high school? No. <laughs> Same here. There, there's no. There's there's nothing that I heard of this in high school. I'm only hearing about all this today. I wonder if this plays into some sort of romantic ideal that Canada has about its history and racial roots. And I wonder if that has something to do with the way in which certain of these narratives that we're going to be talking about today were perpetuated. Or if these certain narratives raise some sort of superiority complex over our southern neighbors. I, I really have no idea what you're talking about, but I think that's another four that's going to go into the shadows right there. <laughs> <laughs> to make clear, what we've been kind of joking about is something, there was an issue that was raised in 2020 that Canada has, and that's the fact that we continue to act superior saying to again places like the states where we see things these racial injustices happening a lot more when the reality is canada has a very very bad habit of putting things under the rug oh yeah oh yeah big time it's it's a huge huge issue that we have to start reconciling with more again me and patrick in this moment we are very much speaking as white males in canada where we have to reconcile the fact that we need to we need to be more open about looking at the dirty parts oh, of yeah. our history. Or we're, the, we're part of the injustice. Yeah, definitely. yeah, we're part of the issue, and it's, it's something that's propagated again through our schools. As we were mentioning before, this isn't things that aren't really taught. It's an issue throughout the whole system, really. Absolutely. And uh, while I didn't explicitly hear about this in high school, like even even as I went along, just in being in contact with society in general, a lot of the points that I that we were just mentioning as a general history of slavery in British North America, this these are the points that we hear about. And while they do point to a dark past, they're often in the way that they're explained, uh, they're often portrayed in a bit more of a positive light, as you're saying. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis our southern neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of like, oh, look, the black loyalists, and uh, see, they came here for better freedom, which is not wrong, right? That was the promise that was offered them. Mm -hmm. But often when we hear about this story, it's very much ignoring the fact that once they got here, they had to go through a whole lot of horrible things, right? The, just because they were free doesn't mean that not only were their peers not necessarily free, but they had a whole slew of difficulties to go, to go through, right? And that's, as you say, just kind of swept under the rug generally. And oh, for sure. I think that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind, even if it's not going to be explicitly stated throughout the episode. I think that's one of the things that we definitely should keep in mind as we go about yeah. this. And I, will, I do want to make the point of, again, this American superiority they teach this in their schools. Mm -hmm. They teach the Civil War. They talk about Gettysburg Address. They talk about Lincoln. It's not taught the best way, and there's obviously still problems, but they teach and they talk about it. And it's taught radically differently depending on whether you in which state you are. For sure. And those are still problems, but they still talk about it. Yes, definitely. And also, like, another point that we often hear, at least here in Canada, is like, hey, look, we abolished slavery 30 years before them, and we didn't even have to have a war about it. So there. You're like, yeah, but... But... Again, just because we didn't fight each other over it, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. Right, exactly. So coming into, if we, if we look at it more into the time frame that we're actually talking about today, uh, or at least where we're at in our chronology, right? The 1830s, 40s, 50s, that kind of thing. Mm. I think a good way to lean into the conversation of Black writing in Canada is just to look at the, the reasons why that was brought up, what literary networks looked like in early Canada, and you know some of the different voices that were emerging throughout this time, both during and after the abolition of slavery. So 
One of the things that's often mentioned, right, in terms of writing, black writing in Canada is that it's very easy to reduce it to the haves versus the have nots. Mm -hmm. So we have freedom and they don't. This is why we have it and why they don't, right? Often, as you say, in relation to Canada and the US, or sometimes free people versus slaves, right? Before the abolition itself. Mm -hmm. When that's not always the case, right? Or if it is, it's very, it's relatively rare. And I think it was poet George Eliot Clark that put it a bit more succinctly when he was saying that most often a lot of the literary works that we're talking about today are the works of political exiles and native dissidents, which, which is basically to say that it's the work of someone who actively wants change, right? How that change takes place and in what form, according to who, what groups have access to that change, that varies from person to person or even from mm-hmm. group to group. But the main underlying theme I think that we can bring it down to is active change, which is, I think, a really interesting way to put it. Oh, for sure. Just to, before we, we get started into this, like in terms of African-Canadian literature, how well-versed are you in it? Like how much have you read in the past? What's In what's African-Canadian? Your... Not really, unfortunately. No. Right. The one uh, for, for, for me, it's mostly modern writers that I, that I was mostly interested in, just mm-hmm. in general, I think. While we make jokes about the fact that I'm very, <laughs> that I spent a lot of time on the 1830s with this podcast, right? Oh, God, that's, yes. That's like one section that I'm not as versed in, even though, as we're just about to see, there were a lot of Black Canadian voices at that time. But and again, that's that... part of the system that we talked about earlier. Absolutely. Where... It's not something that at least in in the States, I know at least somebody like Frederick Douglass is somebody that's a bit more talked about, you know? But yeah. Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, definitely. But again, she's a bit more modern, right? She's not from the 1930s. That's (laughs) true. One of the interesting ways that we can start this conversation is by looking at one of the most direct forms of voices, right? And kind of keep in mind this idea of a network. Mm -hmm. So what I want to start off with is with the newspapers that were actually started by African Canadians. Do it. So in the 1840s, there were already a few attempts that had been started by uh, Black Canadian voices. So namely, we see newspapers like the British American, uh, the Voice of the Fugitive, the Provincial Freeman, Mm -hmm. all of which had relatively short print runs. But that demonstrate the not only the capacity of expressing a voice in a succinct and widespread way, but the existence of a profoundly entrenched network within British North America. And again, that's not something that you very much hear about. We often hear about individual experiences of slavery, right? Whether it's, as you said, Fred- Frederick Douglass or a lot of the narratives that we're going to be talking about later, uh, mm-hmm. Jean Marin, the narratives that Benjamin Drew was writing down. It, we hear individual ideas of it, but we don't really get the sense of an organized network of information, right? Right. With this, it's also, it also points to a fact that very few people, or at least are aware of, or think about, even if they might, it might be aware of it at the back of their mind, is literacy rates right, within African-American communities, or within fugitive slave populations, or ex-slave populations. And it's estimated that about 5% of the fugitive slave population in British North America were literate, which is about 10,000 people by the 1840s. Okay. Right? So- Already, like, a pretty decent amount of people, right, were, were able to, to read these ideas that were promoted. And we'll get to the ideas that were promoted in these newspapers soon. But even the ones that couldn't read, right, they were, the, these magazines and these newspapers were disseminated through oral tra- traditions, right? They were, they were read out loud, right, as a lot of things were. And you could see that basically with any newspapers. While obviously the literacy rates were higher in British and Euro-Canadian spheres, just because, as we mentioned, they had a better access to education, the idea was still the same, right? That you were kind of reading out certain stories and, you know, so, so people could have access to information just the same. Right. And this idea of orality is something that's going to come back also later in the way that some people write uh, their narratives. So if we look at two of the newspapers that were emerging around the 1840s, so The Voice of the Fugitive and The Provincial Freeman, which are basically the two longest lasting of the three that I mentioned. The British American lasted a few months, if I remember correctly. So 
it already shows not only this network, but also just the radically different ways in which people express themselves and on the variety of topics that they express themselves. Right? So there was not necessarily a uniformity with even something as uh, universal in the case of Black Americans uh, or Black Canadians as racism. So if you look, for example, at the voice of the fugitive right, and the ways it attacked racism, it was much more of a newspaper that championed separate settlements and encouraged donations to make that possible. So basically, its editor, who is called Henry Bibb, was saying, you know, help us, help African Canadian people be on their own terms, be over there, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, much in the same way as you hear a lot of Native American uh, activists talking about today, it's like, you know, we're, we can be independent on our own, right? We can do our own thing. As long as you give us the possibilities to do it, right? The same opportunities and resources to be able to do it as Euro Canadians, you know, we can be on our own, right? It's fine. We can have separate settlements, mm -hmm. which is not, again, something that I heard a lot. I heard much more of the rhetoric that was espoused by the provincial freemen, which was much more in favor of integration, right? And a kind of assimilation into Euro Canadian spheres. Funny enough also, or interestingly enough, it's not funny, the editor of The Provincial Freeman, Mary Ann Shad, was actually Canada's first black woman publisher. Right? Oh. So there you go. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, that also points to something that you see. We're not really going to talk about it, I think, today. We might get into it later, but it's it's kind of... Uh, interesting there's a whole subset of research that talks about the ways in which a lot of these african canadian communities were extremely progress oriented with things like this right the first black women publisher um advan uh, better education tactics than what you saw in a lot of euro canadian spheres which are relatively conservative and very religiously oriented mm -hmm. um, and you can see similar ideas for example with western settlements right when we when we're eventually going to talk about it on the show this idea of suffrage, for example. In the West, they got it much faster because there was already this idea of being on the ground floor of progress or progressive ideas. So it's this idea of like, oh, we're already advancing a certain cause, a better cause, so might as well go all in on it with gender equality or a better gender representation, right, with the case of Mary Ann Shad. And you'll see that also with Western settlements, for example. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about and though how these ideas kind of emerge in, uh, well, anywhere, really. I was going to say in a Canadian sphere, but not necessarily. I actually have a question. So you say to the fugitive slave population, so you're talking about the ones that came up on the Underground Railroad. Right. In this case, yes. Right. A lot of these newspapers, you're right, I, I, I didn't mention it, but a lot of these newspapers were started by fugitive slaves. Mm -hmm. right? And this kind of points to the fact, much in the same way in which a lot of newspapers in Nova Scotia or literary cultures in Nova Scotia were started by loyalists. Right? And it kind of points to the wealth of information or the better networking of information that was available in the States than it was in Canada at the time. For sure. I just think it's an important thing to point out again, this, um, the fact, because it's the 1840s, so I don't want people to be confused, like, if yes. there were, that, as if there were still slaves or slaves of this nature in Canada. Yes, you're absolutely right to point to that. Although, yeah. so basically, a lot of these were fugitive slaves from the States, mm -hmm. and then they would live in Canada, and once, once they were there, they would criticize not only the slavery that was still going on in the States, but they would criticize racist policies in Canada as well. Right. That's that's what they were able Good. to do. Good on them. them. Oh, yeah. Say what you will. Like, fantastic that they had the capability of doing this, right? That they were allowed to do this um, in Canada, despite the racist policies that were being promoted. Okay. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Use your... But well, that's the greatest instrument we will always have. Yeah, but this kind of leads to a bit of a darker turn. And again, something that we rarely hear about is that, well, on the whole, a lot of these voices and arrivals of uh, fugitive slaves were perceived in a po relatively positive way in the 1830s, right? Mostly because of what we were saying earlier. It gives a lot of ammunition for British North Americans to attack our American neighbors to the South. Be like, see, we're better. They're coming here, right? Eh? Mm -hmm. What you start to see around the 1840s and as these voices emerge is an increased criticism that they exist, right? 
And okay. I think that's very interesting. Like you'll start seeing not only the fact that there are too many that are coming in, right? Mm-hmm. But also this idea that starts criticizing the way in which they express themselves, right? Mm-hmm. You're starting to attack, oh, they're not using quote unquote proper English in the newspaper. Oh, they're not talking about things that should be talked about. And you start to see this rhetoric shift after the abolition of slavery. And as the number of fugitive slaves arrive, you start to see the shifted rhetoric towards a bit more of a fearful one. Right. Um, and I think that swing is particularly interesting. So wait, 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 they were afraid of more coming in or? In a, some of them, yeah. You start to see, and I'm not saying it's a majority of Canadian populations. I actually don't have the statistics in front of me, but it's this idea of, yeah, there's a lot coming in. And what are the implications of having so many fugitive slaves coming in? They're going to steal our jobs. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it, people. The rhetoric hasn't changed, man. History is a cycle. Yeah. It's literally just the same shit on repeat over and over again. I just thought it was an interesting thing to bring up. Of this it's idea. like when you're rewatching Friends on Netflix, except it's a really bad show. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to bring this up. Even though we're going to be talking about narratives and writings that happened before this, I, I wanted to open up with this idea of not only the networks, but the reactions to uh, these first attempts at newspapers and networking and widespread voices. Mm-hmm. Right? Not only the ability, but the ability to be criticized or to see various voices of dissent appear within British North America. Right. I genuinely like the fact that we covered the newspapers first, because I think that's an important integral thing to look at, especially when it comes to getting the message of the people. Yes. I think newspapers are incredibly important. Again, linking it to today's times, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we, that was happening with Black Lives Matter was protests and marches. There was also a lot of it was about the social media coverage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And about getting proper coverage because the major news outlets were obviously not up to task. So Mm -hmm. it became a lot of the fact of people having to work with each other over social media. Absolutely. And who can say certain things on social media, how it Mm -hmm. was promoted. Absolutely. Giving the fact of presenting the stuff that's again swept under the rug. Oh, yeah. And this comes back to what we were saying before of like history as a narrative, right? Who we were talking about that a few episodes ago. This idea of who controls the narrative, who says what about it, why is extremely important. Oh, for sure. So the the, these newspapers were they're a key part of this of this story that you have to tell. Yeah, absolutely. If that's all, we're going to move on to what is considered by some to be the so-called genesis of African-Canadian literature. <laughs> I, genesis is a good word, I think, in this case, <laughs> Just because it's a religious narrative. Right? As many things are. As many things are. But I love talking about Canadian literary canon. <laughs> God, it's like watching the poor, it's like watching the nerdy kid try and build his sand castle. Sand castle. <laughs> he tries so hard. But I mean, we'll, we'll get waves. to that. We'll get to the why we're, why we're making fun of this, but... It's not because of the actual person the writing. I want to make that clear. I'm making yeah, yeah. fun of, like, Canadian literary scholars trying to keep forcing this canon. Yeah, just the idea of a canon in general for me is kind that of too. weird. But yeah. That too. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to talk about now is the narrative of a preacher, right? A black Mm -hmm. preacher, a Methodist called Jean Marat or Marant. I assume he would have been called if he was English American. I doubt he spoke French. So John Marant. (laughs) I was about to say, why is he a Quebecois now? It's just because I I see it written like that and I automatically read it in French because... Translation. Because translation. Because I I would be very surprised if it wasn't from a French name or Mm -hmm. a French sounding name. It sounds like it, but... Yeah, he probably would have said Marant. So John Marant, even though he was an American Methodist uh, and traveling preacher, he was he, uh, his writing is considered by namely scholars like George Eliot Clark, who we mentioned before, to be about as close to the first African-Canadian narrative that we have. Right? Right. Because a lot of the themes that he presents in it are going to basically be recurring throughout the history of African-Canadian literature. 
And also because apparently he spent a couple months in Nova Scotia, so that makes him sometimes Canadian. Yay! That's how that works. <laughs> Before it was even remotely close to being called Canada, but that's another that's, issue. That's what I was laughing at. Yes. I thought to make people clear, the fact that we had this man living in Canada for a couple months, and then he suddenly becomes the figure of Canadian African literature, or African Canadian literature. I mean, when we think about it, like, there's a lot of stuff that we say, oh, you know, it was a first in Canada, or, or a, a literary moment in Canada, and you're like, I mean, by that standard, anything before 1867 was just not. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. It, and it's just the fact that, like, if anything, it's more African-American literature, Yes. Or British, because he ended up living. He was here for like, he arrived here, in, no, he arrived in Nova Scotia in 1785. Yeah. And then he, but then he ended up settling in Boston, Massachusetts. And then he returned to London. Yeah. He was all over the place much longer than he was in Nova Scotia. Anyway, you can make the argument that everything started somewhere <laughs> and had influences in other countries and wherever. Everything I, started in Canada. I can, I can see the argument behind it. The point is, he emits a lot of themes that will become relevant to later African-Canadian narratives. So there is an argument to be made of his influence. That being said, what did you think of John Marin's narrative? So basically... Uh, as a kind of overview of what it, of who he was, right? He was a, mm -mm. a, a traveling preacher who was captured by uh, First Nations and eventually released. And he eventually made his way up to Nova Scotia, where he would continue his conversion attempts, not only of the First Nations, and he would basically be a traveling preacher, including in Nova Scotia. And his narrative is the story of his life, including the capture uh, by the Cherokee, including his travels in Nova Scotia, the beginning of his life, so on and so forth. Right. So what did you think of this narrative as a whole? I mean, I'm, I'm looking over it again, and... You know, I'm not seeing the usual First Nations descriptors. Right? No, you don't see any of the usual, oh, these, again, the savages. Mm -hmm. He just straight up calls them the Cherokees or the Indians, which again, it's, that's not what they, what they weren't, the Indians, but that's the accepted term at the time. Yes. And he's not having the same bloody descriptions that you get with, again, Emily Montague's writing or any of those other ones, which is interesting. Or literally any other writing exactly from that. Any topic. other writing from a white person, essentially. Yeah, exactly. I think this kind of points to one of the ways in which he represents an early form of uh, African-Canadian writings, right, is while he's less interested in this narrative, at least I find in overtly criticizing race relations in North America, he does a bit, but he, he'll do more of it in other texts, right? He's more interested in the power of communities, right? And the right. power of coalescing around an idea. In this case, Methodism. Methodistism? Being a Methodist. A, a Methodist. Yes. So he's more interested in this idea of community, of coalescing around this idea, and, you know, bringing in not only these Native Americans, but of bringing in other African Canadians or Black people, just simply Black people at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he was eventually a Freemason, so you know, he had this sense of community going on and an awareness of the power of the many, right? This networking that we were mentioning with the newspapers that would come up a lot later, but this idea of having friends and groups that have similar ideas and through which you can promote much more easily and much uh, with much greater power, I think, an idea such as equality, right? Or such right. as a sense of community. So the sense of community is honestly, a lot of the times, the best place to start for getting a sense of power. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think, and I think that's just a, a sign of the times already that he was a free black person, really quite well-known preacher for, within his circles. I think it would have been possibly harder for him to actually overtly criticize race relations. Mm -hmm. As we were mentioning, abolitionist movements were barely getting off the ground at this moment. So it was it would have been a bit harder possibly for him to, to overtly criticize it. But the, this idea of community, certain, uh, community certainly does advance certain ideas. Right? So it's more in relation of how freedom can be appreciated by all as a as a group than mm -hmm. overtly saying, hey, look, the 
uh, black people should be free and racism is horrible and really being all fire and brimstone and really going all at it. Fire and brimstone. Which some of the narratives, we're not going to talk about them today necessarily, but some of the narratives that you see, especially later in the 1800s, straight up that. It's very apocalyptic and it's great. Oh my God. It's fantastic. Apocalypse now, baby. Oh yeah, but you see a lot, I think it was another preacher, I forget his name at the time, who was very much of like, yo, racism is going to send you straight to hell. And awesome. <laughs> it's, I love that so much. Um, Good. Yeah, but speaking of his encounters with, with the Cherokee, namely, I think it's very interesting, something that was brought up uh, in my readings, is that there's a kind of mystical sense to it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if the way you read it, uh, I, I can kind of see why certain scholars would say that this idea of magic realism kind of shines through. Again, I think that's part of travel literature. Okay. Just because it's, it's, it's the mystical unknown. Mm -hmm. It's something that's going to come up often, and, you know, so the magic realism, a lot of times that magic realism takes the form of racism where, again, a presentation of the other as this disgusting feature. But here we have a more positive magic realism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I mean that in the sense. So there was a whole section where he he encounters native communities for one of the first times, or even just in his initial experiences with God. Right when he first try, mentions his experiences with God, that's a really good one. Also, mm -hmm. where he says, for example, that he falls unconscious and that he heard every word from the minister like it was a parcel of swords thrust into me. Uh, and what added to my distress, I thought I saw the devil on every side of me, right? It's right. very exaggerated, but you definitely get the sense throughout his narrative of this larger than life experience that he's going through, right? And the way also I was just mentioning the Cherokee, he describes them, he kind of, they kind of appear out of nowhere. They're a, kind of, they're, they're a force of nature almost, in a sense. <laughs> and you see that a lot in his writing, which I find really fascinating. For sure. From my, like a lot of the experience, speaking of, we were talking about Toni Morrison earlier, like the, that kind of writing definitely shines through, I think. Like this, this use of magic realism, I think is one that's going to be perpetuated in a lot of black literature in North America. Well, commenting on that just a mm -hmm. little bit, just from what black literature I have read, it's something yeah. I think that comes up a lot. And I think it's just their way of writing that is so much different than ours. Yeah, definitely. And you can see like... You can see, uh, if you want a, a more concrete example of it, like this Mardi Gras kind of thing that you see in Louisiana, that kind of culture of going into these bigger festivities that are larger than mm -hmm. life and it play onto these mystical elements and song and dance, right? That would have been imported from right, African cultures, you know, in the early slave ships, and that would have been perpetuated through oral tales, right? Mm -hmm. And this kind of comes back, like this tradition is not lost, right? Just because it's put into writing. Oh, for sure. It's, again, it's uh, an example from a different, totally different genre. I was talking with my father. He told me, I can't remember the name now, which I hate, mm -hmm. but it's a fantasy series and it's written by a black woman. She's very much versed in her history and her culture. And he says the writing style in the ideas are totally different than anything else oh, okay with like the basis in her culture and history again it's when you're looking at first nations writing yes and how much more sensory and mystically driven it is you know it's a totally different way of living which i think makes for very interesting literary narrative and you know it's going back to this idea of magic right or music and song okay. and dance yeah. like i don't know if you had a, any thoughts about the fact like he spends a big part of this narrative or at least the start of it talking about how he learned music mm. there are straight up like three or four paragraphs where he mentions music the first half of the second paragraph is just him learning the french horn and being versed into the power and, uh, you know, the transporting effects of music and its ability to transgress narratives or, or mm -hmm. and to go across language barriers and really get you into an emotion, which I think is absolutely integral to a lot, a lot of African Canadian writing that I've read. This musicality to it. Uh, yeah. Again, we're, we're just talking from our own experiences with African literature for sure, and what we've seen and what we've read. Yeah. And a lot of the ideas that I'm pulling from also are from like secondhand criticisms of John Mahon's mm -hmm. narrative and, um, you know, how people have interpreted it, African-American scholars and, you know, scholars alike. But this, I, I think there are definitely good criticisms to bring up. Right? Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. What else did you have to say about uh... John Merritt? Yeah. Um, I don't know. My main comment was just based on Canada trying to again like craft this literary tale of their can- uh, canonicity. Yeah. Okay. But do you see? I don't know, with like this brief overview that we've just been talking about, do you see where some of that idea comes from? I think so, yeah. I think, again, like he's the community narrative is always something that Canada is interested in. Mm -hmm. And again, let me see, liberty, justice, faith, bit of the Canadian way right there. Sure. But again, is that exclusively Canadian? Like, you get a lot of that in the States oh, also. Oh, if you want me to get into that, you're going to be totally talking about my <laughs> thoughts in Canadian canon. That's a whole other debate that we have to have. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I can still kind of see what people like George Eliot Clark were talking about when they're saying, at least it sets the groundwork. It's not entirely oh, distinct. I think I can, Canadian. I can get with behind that statement 100%. Like, yeah. a lot of this stuff... Again, even like Emily Montague, these are things that set the groundwork for what would then become Canadian, the Canadian literature, African Canadian literature, feminist Canadian literature. These works definitely set some major groundwork down. Yeah. All right. I I agree. So if that's all, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about two narratives that show possibly a different perspective on the idea of writing a slave narrative or of communicating a slave narrative in the 1840s and 1850s. So you can stick around for that. I just want to cut in for a minute to tell you about a really cool documentary that I think listeners of the show will be really interested in. It's called Creative Spaces, Queer and Italian Canadian. This documentary questions, what does it mean to be queer and Italian Canadian? What experiences do queer Italian Canadians have when their sexual orientation and gender identity come in contact with their cultural heritage and traditions? Alicia Canton, the director of the documentary Creative Spaces, is hopeful that this project will help to encourage new conversations on these topics and celebrate the great diversity of that community. There's going to be a premiere of the documentary on Wednesday, March 3rd from 3 to 5 p.m. Montreal time on Zoom, so everyone across the world can join. And the premiere will be followed by a panel discussion with the director and plenty of artists that are featured in the documentary. I'll be posting a link in the show notes so that you can see for yourself. I think it's really worth the while, and I'll definitely be checking it out. I hope to see you there. And we're back. Yay. All right. So there are two slave narratives that we're going to be looking at today, or... One of them is a compilation of various slave narratives, and one of them is the slave narrative of a single person. And we're going to talk about the differences between the two, how one was written differently than the other, and the whole slippery slope that that can bring about (laughs) in this case. We're basically going to be looking first at Benjamin Drew's book called The Refugee, Mm-hmm. or which is called Narratives of Fugitive Slaves in Canada. You can also sometimes find it as the North Side View of Slavery, which we'll get into why later. And the second text that we're going to be looking at is a book called The Narrative of Thomas Smallwood by Thomas Smallwood. <laughs> and both were written in the 1850s. Right? So one of them was 1856, Benjamin Drew, and Thomas Walwood was in 1851. Just starting off with Benjamin Drew's The Refugee, the idea behind it was to compilate a series of tales and experiences by a variety of Black people who couldn't necessarily read or write and explain their experiences or depict their experiences in basically quote-unquote, taking the Underground Railroad, right, because it wasn't actually a railroad, and escaping to Canada. And the entire goal was to be as a response to a book that came out the year before in 1855 called Nehemiah Adams's A South Side View of Slavery, which was much more, which was much less critical of slavery, let's just say. We're going to leave it at that because we could do a whole episode on a South Side View of Slavery and how terrible it is. But the idea is definitely to, pre- to present Canada, at least, in a bit more of a positive light. Right? Not necessarily ignore the fact that there were bad things, but the thing of the book is that it's a direct criticism of American slavery 
and how these people that are talking in the text experienced it and how they escaped from it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did you read much of it? Uh, Benjamin the, refugee? the Refugee? Yeah. I read more of the introduction, which okay. I'll, basically a lot of it, like the introduction of the introduction, because this is we have an edited version that we're reading. Yes. So there's the long introduction done again by George Eliot Clark. Yeah, the dude wrote a lot. Again, the opening line says it all, and I think it's a very powerful line. Go for it. Proudly, we Canadians blame the practice of African slavery in North America on two-faced Americans, those who preach hatred for monarchy and love for freedom, but only for citizens touting white-skinned male genitals in a Bible. And he goes on to basically tear down the Canadian notion of superiority towards slavery, which I think is a very powerful thing to do. Oh, yeah. Because... It's, it's a very powerful thing to do because the entire book is essentially propaganda. Yeah. Right. You, you could definitely make that argument, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, like, and it's kind of a really big move to include in the introduction the fact of like, hey, this book is kind of crap in many ways. <laughs> yeah. This, this, again, he's more commenting on the crap of what everything around the content. Yeah. The publication. The publisher is a white man, isn't it? Mm -hmm. exactly we we're gonna address that but benjamin drew is a white guy and it's also the book goes to great pains to say oh things weren't changed when they were rewritten or whatever we just made some minor changes so that the words spelled out properly or something it's like okay so you did rewrite the book a bit yeah and and also there's no way like uh, i don't know how much you looked at it but for people listening at home like a lot of the narratives are like three or four pages long Mm -hmm. right for each of them they include a lot of people into this and oh yeah they're basically oh, my snippets God. they're basically snippets of lives right so there is an edit there's no way that people living through slavery no matter where you're from whether it's from the states or canada or from botswana wherever you are but there's no way that you can condense that experience down into two pages right? it's also just like again let's make the one book with everybody mm -hmm. in it therefore we don't have to make any more exactly Right. And that's not to say that there's that the, the, the idea behind this book is entirely ill intended. Mm -hmm. right? The idea of putting together a book of tales, right, for a lot of these people, right, we we're mentioning a lot of them didn't have, uh, weren't literate, right? So mm -hmm. to, to put in a book form a lot of these experiences that could then be propagated and so on and so forth, right, is not a bad idea in and of itself. Oh, no, not at all. The, and, Especially at the time, right? Benjamin Drew would have probably had a bit more um, uh, connections than the average African Canadian would have had in the publishing world to allow for the book to be made in the first place. But you, when you think about it for more than two and a half seconds, right? It just completely, to me, reading some of them, it completely strips the power and the rawness of talking about these uh, narratives can have. Right. right. It's an asepticized version of it. Right? Yeah, I can get that. And I mean, I, I have a few examples that we can pull from, but if you look at even the first, the, the actual introduction of the book, right? If you, or, or the start of the book, right? If, under the chapter heading St. Catherine's, you can find this book online for free, by the way, although. Pretty easy to find, which is nice. Yeah. Under the St. Catherine's uh, heading, right? The first lines really sell the sensationalist nature of this book to me. Right, where Drew writes, Refuge, refuge for the oppressed, refuge for Americans escaping from abuse and cruel bondage in their native land, refuge for my countrymen from the lash of the overseer, from the hounds and guns of the southern manhunters, from the clutches of the northern marshals and commissioners. Rest, rest for the hunted slave, rest for the travel soiled and foot sore fugitive. This seems to oh, Canada. <laughs> for, first of all, yeah, and to me, this reads very much like a sermon. Yep, I can get those tones. Right, this idea that you're kind of preaching to a choir, literally in this case. Right, you're who wrote this opening bit, like the bit that's right under. Drew Catherine. himself. So the the, the refuge author of for the my book. countrymen from the last. What's his skin color again? He's white, but he's talking of Americans in general. Refuge for my countrymen, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, true. Oh, true. Yeah, it's rough. But you know, even if we even if we look at a lot of the tales that are portrayed in it, it's kind of it's kind of difficult for me to accept this idea. Even going beyond this idea that we were talking about, of he he barely touched the narrative, right? You, right. As you, as you mentioned, I have a lot of difficulty accepting that, even beyond the idea of correcting so-called mistakes, right? 
not only does correcting the mistakes in and of itself already that's a big thing for me because it removes i think some of the authenticity of the way people spoke and it removes from the oral quality that we've mentioned time and time again uh, as integral to a lot of these narratives and a lot of the networking that african canadians and african americans did right so first of all that removes from it but just the way in which the, the the storytelling reads it doesn't seem to me possible that it would be so asepticized it's part of the whitewashing yeah Definitely. You're literally taking away their voice by making those changes. And again, the the way that they speak, the words that they speak, their tone and intonations and all that. That's part of somebody's voice. It's like when we read the poetry earlier on, you know, and you, you, we decided like the one that we, what was it? The one we read in the Scottish accent. Joseph Howe. Yeah. I was like, that's part of his voice. Mm -hmm. And right now you are literally stripping away their voice to present it the way that you want to. Yeah, exactly. Which is the wrong way to do it. So I'm sure he might have some sort of positive intention when he started. I hope he had a positive intention, but it's the wrong way to do it. A lot of the ways in which, you know, when, when, you, when you read about the violence in this, it's very, it's relatively tame. Yes, they talk about whippings, they talk about things, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel visceral to me, right? No. Even by 19th century standards, like the the, which would have been naturally a bit less harsh in some regards than what we're used to today. But even by that standard, like, I, I'm trying to go through quickly um, the book to, to find the passage I was talking, uh, I had read earlier, but the, the whipping that they describe is very much like, oh, well, my mother was whipped and it was horrible and then we moved on. And you're like, mm-hmm. okay, yes. But there can probably be more to that, right? There's, there's a lot more that you can unpack about the horrors of such things than you're clearly doing. For sure. Yeah. I don't know. To me, this kind of points to some of the failures of the abolitionist movement, right? Uh, at the time, at least. In so far as not the fact that it existed, not at all. No. But the fact of who had a more powerful voice within the abolitionist movement Right. Okay. Uh, in in the sense that, and you can see this in, for example, when I, when I was first talking about it in uh, episode seven, when I first talked about slavery, right? Um, Lawrence Hill's "Someone Knows My Name," or it's known as the Book of Negroes here in Canada. The whole idea, right, behind it at the very end, you follow this slave girl right. who's a fictional character, but the whole thing is at the at the end, she kind of meets these abolitionists, and it's all a bunch of white guys, right, who <laughs> use her as a token. To be like, hey, we're doing progress for you, right? But we're going to be the ones who speak in front of the parliament. Oh, God. Right. But a lot of it was that, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's horrible to think so. And that's not to say that there were no uh, voices of African Canadians or African Americans at the time, right? Not at all. There were a lot of them speaking out against this, right? And especially the one that we're going to be talking about after uh, Benjamin Drew. But this to me f- represents some of the failures of that movement of like, you're still perpetuating a lot of the ideas mm-hmm. that got us here in the first place. And even the ways in which he, he, he goes about explaining the Underground Railroad, or at least depicting uh, the people's accounts of the Underground Railroad, it's very much like, hey, we're going towards freedom and barely anything harsh happened. Again, it's the same kind of thing of what, we were, what we've been trying to avoid of representing somebody else's hardships or discussing somebody else's hardships. Yes, exactly. He's everything we shouldn't be. Yeah. He's, he's a very good primer for what not to do. Because like you said, the good intentions don't matter if you have no respect for how these people want to get it done. To, to me, this would have been much more effective. Like, even if you accept, like, some of the other stuff, the fact that he's a white guy and stuff like that, like, which you shouldn't. But this idea of... Um, I think it would have been at least more effective if he had let the time uh, for these tales to grow and expand, right? Mm. Instead of having them whittled down to three, four, or five pages, right, go into these in-depth narratives. Right? This would have been a much more potent text to me. I can see that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add about uh, Drew? No, I don't think so. Read no. the actual tales because they are there. You know, and this yeah. is the account that we have. Well, I mean, I can I can read you one right now because it's four lines long. Go ahead. <laughs> so this is from John Atkinson. I escaped from Norfolk, Virginia. A man who has been in slavery knows, and no one else can know, the yearnings to be free and the fear of making the attempt. It is like trying to get religion and not seeing the way to escape condemnation. That's yeah, that it. was totally whitewashed. That's it. 
like I'm, sh- I'm sure Atkinson had other stuff to say, or maybe it was meant to be a bit more poetic and read like something you read on like some inspirational quote. But the, the idea is it, that, that this proves everything that we were talking about, right? It's just kind of septicized and short cut. Well, it's also the fact we can't even properly debate the merits of this because the other recordings don't exist. Yes. Exactly. Right? So or we can we, this case. <laughs> yeah, we can we I honestly like I wanna say that this is probably a whitewash, but again, I don't even know. I don't even know if John Atkinson had more to say, if he had less to say, if he did not or did it have this religious message. Yeah. It's like the yeah, it's the short ones are kind of interesting to read. Like the one right above it, James and Williams, it's literally one line. Yeah. I came from bondage in Norfolk, Virginia. Slavery is horrible. Horrible, horrible. That one I think is probably a bit closer to what was legitimately written at the time Mm -hmm. because this one again and this is actually part of the problem you can highlight the john atkinson one is so proper it's properly written properly presented and so it throws a lot of maybe john atkinson was this literate this able to speak this well there's a very good chance he was but barry or is it barry berm benjamin drew benjamin drew set himself up for us to constantly question the credibility but I, I don't think he would have necessarily, he probably wouldn't have even thought of it. Obviously, he wasn't planning on us reading it in 2021, but like mm-hmm. uh, with a critical eye, but he was probably thinking about it. Well, obviously, everyone's going to believe the veracity of this, right? Um, right. And to be fair, and this is something that George Eliot Clark brings up in the introduction that you mentioned at the start, right? To be fair, a lot of people did. A lot of people really bought into this. This has become kind of a bona fide classic within okay. the slave narrative genre in Canada. Right. And it was hugely influential in the way in which people wrote about and wrote of slave narratives <laughs> Canada, right? For, for decades. <laughs> so like he got what he had and like, he's basically representing everything that you just said. It, it, it kind of taints the waters as to how we look at other slave narratives since then. Sometimes if you're setting yourself up for credibility, now I don't know what to think of John Atkinson's account. Cause I want to think that he would be able to give this well presented image, but then you're saying you've edited a lot of these entries. Yeah. And so now John Atkinson is thrown, a, using him as the example, is thrown into this weird Schrodinger's thing, the Schrodinger's writing paradox now. <laughs> Was the writing, was his original thoughts in writing good or was it just edited to be good? I don't know. If we contrast this, for example, with our second text, Thomas Smallwood's narrative, Mm -hmm. um, you know, already comes into what we were saying earlier of being a single narrative. He goes into a lot of depth. Already, this is 60 pages just on one idea. It's about 60 or 70 pages and it just goes in depth, right? And this is considered to be the first a Canadian account of a slave narrative, right? So it comes mm-hmm. out f- five years before Benjamin Drew. This is debatable. There was Robertson's The Book of the Bible Against Slavery that came out quite a while before, a few years before, but it was possibly too American to be considered Canadian. But then again, mm-hmm. we were talking about John Marant's earlier <laughs> narrative. So <laughs> who knows what anything is really at this point? <laughs> Generally in academic circles, Thomas Swallow's narrative is considered to be a first in the slave narrative genre. And one of the finest examples, um, it's a much more controlled and, you know, as people have mentioned, self-defined voice. He's talking for himself. He wrote this himself. He is talking about his own experiences and he pulls no punches. Right. This is much more in line with, while he's not always explicit in the horror of things, it's much more in line with the ability and willingness to talk about uh, the things that should be talked about when we're talking about slavery right? mm-hmm. in Canada or in the U.S. Thomas Smallwood, this is, sorry, just to yes. clarify. Yes. Perfect. I don't know. Have you read any of this? Or did you I've go been... through the million epitaphs that are at the beginning? <laughs> I think I'm still on the epitaphs. I just... <laughs> Jesus, Lord and mercy. <laughs> but like... <laughs> That I, I think we can actually just talk about the epitaphs themselves. Like we're, we're not just going to talk about that, but this is a good place to start. So for readers who wouldn't necessarily have the text in front of them, this is a really interesting thing. There's like, I'm looking at it, there's six or seven epitaphs before the actual text starts. Right. And no, there's more than that. There's like 10, but they're from a variety of sources, all or most white guys right? From the 16th and 17th century. So you get, you get John Milton, you get William Copper, you get... Wait, so uh, when you say John Milton, is it... Which John Milton is this? Yo, straight up Paradise Lost John Milton. What the shit? Regardless of which John Milton we're talking about, it can also, like, you can also just look to 
you can also just look to uh there's shakespeare he quotes him twice mm-hmm. right? he quotes islamic philosophy he quotes byron longfellow robert burns <laughs> they're all quotes about the inequities either of slavery or of prejudice and the horrors of humanity i guess i thought this was a really interesting addition mm-hmm. right not only because it points to the extreme wealth of knowledge that thomas smallwood has right he having been clearly well versed in english oh, so he's quoting people with the epitaphs yes uh yeah you could literally go you could probably write an essay just based on why he chose certain ones Probably, yeah. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it's already been done. Yeah. <laughs> like, but oh, the, Cymbeline's here. Yeah, Cymbeline. Like the one Shakespeare thing that no one reads. Um, anyway. Yeah, I've read it. Uh, but yeah. Don't it's kind of, Shakes. I think it's also, it might be a way of him showing the hypocrisy of a lot of these people, right? Mm-hmm. Writing of injustice and writing of prejudice and racism and slavery from a perspective that most of them probably wouldn't really understand <laughs> or at least not. in the same way that they're claiming to right right uh, so i think there's a bit of a power move by smallwood here and i really enjoy it also what i really like about the version that i have in front of me they don't edit out the errors oh my god so if you look already just if you keep in the epitaphs it's shakespeare it's not shakespeare there's an e missing and they keep them throughout shakespeare oh yeah Shake. it's much more french <laughs> love it but like throughout they they have highlighted and read the so-called mistakes right and to to me it it really points to the fact that smallwood is going just off of his memory and a bit more in a free-flowing way right and it comes back to this idea of a much more controlled narrative mm-hmm. he's basically writing the way he wants but it just just beyond that i think i think what he what he does is also very interesting in that his accounts of the underground railroad not only are they more personal because they are <laughs> they are literally his experiences and not just transcriptions yeah. of other people's but he he's not really afraid of pulling of pulling out like a bit more of the harsher realities of the underground railroad Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, on page 19, 20, and 21, he talks a lot about the economic aspects. So he talks about, right, the price for their freedom and this idea that, you know, people really want to make a profit out of all of this. Of the Underground Railroad? Yeah. Fun. Yeah, like that people aren't necessarily, there are some that are definitely doing out of the goodness of their heart, but people aren't really in a lot of cases, not necessarily doing this just out of the goodness, right? They're people. Well, it's, it's again, it's like we said at the very beginning, why it started in the first place was because of the triangle trade was why it persisted for so long. Mm-hmm. So now we're entering the phase of they're doing it because they can get a profit, a profit off of it. Literally, there's a really great line here on page 20 that's awesome. Uh, but, here, I'll just do it. <laughs> but this is only a small exhibition of their misdirected charity. I expected better things of abolitionists. While I expected no good of colonialist, coloni, coloni, colonizationists. colonizationists, thank you. <laughs> Notwithstanding these parties, without a murmur, would give their thousands to purchase a few individuals. They would complain bitterly against Mr. Tari, uh, someone who we had met earlier, and myself if they were called upon by us to give a few shillings to those fugitives whom we met, whom we sent along them, to help them out of harm's way yikes just calling it as it is Damn, <laughs> this, i love it i i really like this passage do it basically again basically saying like yo these abolitionists are not just they're not just good guys right they're 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 trying something but it's not necessarily always from the goodness of their heart mm-hmm. um which is again something that you rarely hear in like mainstream discourse about slave narratives and i really appreciate with this text yeah oh yeah i, I appreciate that sentence that you brought up i think it's a powerful message to put forward and again, I'll also just bring up the fact that like these abolitionists weren't the best people. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they weren't saints. They weren't virtues. And it all again, he's it's a it's it's the very common white savior technique that is often used. Yeah, that needs to be broken down more. Mm-hmm. And I think this a part of this comes from. And you see this throughout the text. A lot of this comes from, I think, Smallwood's uh, ambivalence towards power. And this uh, this is, again, not just me who's saying this. This is a lot of the criticism that I was reading. But the his ambivalence towards people's motivations for power and how much influence someone can exercise over another, even in a case where you're 
try, where you're saying you're doing a good thing, right? He was obviously mm-hmm. and rightfully so scarred by that kind of rhetoric when he was in the States uh, or when he was a slave. Right? And it's something that's going to stay with him for the rest of his life. And I think that's something that I think is really the message, uh, one of the great messages that you can take out of this narrative is the long lasting effects of all of this. Mm-hmm. Something that you don't get at all with the likes of Benjamin Drew. But here he clearly makes a point of saying, this is a lifetime thing. Right? This is a generational thing. Oh, for sure. This is something that still needs to be worked on. Oh yeah. It's including the white savior narrative. Well, I guess like I have a few questions that we can kind of end us off with. Do it. All right. So th- well, obviously we were talking about like three or four examples here and there's a wealth of other uh, African Canadian and black writers in general that mm-hmm. we could have pulled from. But you know, do you have any thoughts on the fact that a lot of these early writers, we already talked about this, but I guess do you have any final thoughts about the fact that a lot of these early writers were exiled African Americans, right? About the fact that when we're talking about early Canadian literature or back Canadian literature, there's very little Canadian about it, or that it seems very much pulled from I think, America? I think this again speaks to how much of the literature is again swept under the rug type of situation how much of the literature is simply pushed away stored away for later as opposed to facing the an issue head on if that makes any sort of sense yeah uh i would agree with that and it also points to what we were saying before of like trying to find these very minute differences to say like this is canadian right or black canadian or whatever you want it's like just think of it as a as a narrative of inequity, right? A narrative mm-hmm. of freedom, right? <laughs> uh, try to understand the reasons why it happened in the first place, why these people are writing down these tales and expressing themselves in ways that are trying to change the world rather than saying who comes from where. Right. I, I also thought that it was very interesting that, you know, a lot of these slave narratives, as we were saying, were adopted into fiction and nonfiction. Right? Okay. <sighs> To me, it kind of represents like the politics of literature as a concept, right? Not necessarily that literature can talk about politics, but that literature itself is a political tool. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Has a political capacity. Oh, for well, again, look at Benjamin yes. Drew and his yeah. constant, like that Canadian propaganda is basically what it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of a, it, it, this was a harsh reminder for me of like questioning what kind of slave narratives we were uh, people were adopting or looking to uh, i don't think it's all necessarily negative we, we no. talked about the the newspaper ones that's an no. in, that's an idea of what the positive political influx of, in positive political impacts of literature yes because it was fully controlled by black people yes uh or yes. mostly mostly yes mostly controlled which is not not the best, not the most ideal and perfect, but very good. And they were able to produce their message as they saw fit. Being political isn't automatically me being negative. I, I'm not saying that it's, it's a negative art. Yeah, but it just it, it just reminds us of you know what what we can accomplish with literature or what's what's at stake when we think of literature. Yeah, I can feel that. Yeah. I see this one, this question you have on the slave narrative yeah. as a genre in Canada. And I do want to comment on that okay. one. Yes, go for it. Solely in the fact that I don't think it's our place to decide whether or not the slave narrative is a genre of Canada, simply due to the fact that there probably are large groups of people that would speak to this and feel as if it spoke for them. Yes. Um, the question, I, I, I had written it there because a lot of people... The critics and the historians are coming. No, those damned pesky critics and historians, just people with jobs. <laughs> Lock away your children before the demons come. No, but a lot of people relegate it exclusively to the realms of a U.S. thing. That, uh, the, the, the question was formulated in the sense of, hey, why the, the, that slave narratives are something that is only an American phenomenon. Right. It's not the fact that it doesn't speak to people in Canada at all. Like I'm sh- again, literature can speak to you no matter where you're from or what country you're you know, <clears throat> you're reading. But the idea was to question whether or not it is an exclusively American thing, which I don't think it is. To re- to say that not only diminishes everything of African Canadian literature, saying like again like it's a it's a it's more it's a regulated U.S. genre that not only makes that worse but it also makes the countless others again how many chinese canadians were brought over here and then all the horrible things that happened to them in their creation of the railroad yeah 
or any times of any purchasing of the First Nations people. The slave narrative and the slave narrative as a genre can be distinctly Canadian. It is not distinctly U.S. Yeah, it's to me, this is also, this also points to the fact of the prevalence of sweeping the, it under the rug in Canada. Yes. But oh, I was going to say like, um, putting a lot of emphasis on written narratives as right. something superior, right? Because if you're looking at just that idea, which I think a lot of these critics are doing, I also think written narratives are superiors. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but like, if you're looking at it just from the perspective of that, okay. Yes. There are more narratives written down in the States. There's that's a a, that's of... any genre. That's literally every genre. Exactly, right? The because States has more people than we do. There are 10 times more people, right? Of course you're going to get more literature, if anything. <laughs> Why do you, it's, it makes no sense, right? That's the basis of quantity is like saying that the population of Canada isn't actually a Canadian population. <laughs> yeah, but, That's the but, dumbest reasoning I, I, and I've never seen it explicitly stated, but like I think the underlying current of a lot of that is that because the, a lot of the ideas are like, well, they're just not as many, and slavery was abolished before there's a real literature. First of all, no, it, it wasn't. still existed. By it the way, then it still existed. It still existed. First of all, just because we got rid of it a little bit earlier doesn't mean it just stopped happening. Exactly, and also like people wrote stuff down in Canada before yeah. slavery was abolished. <laughs> also, second of all. Just to just to hammer the point home, it still exists. And if yes. you want an example, if you want a very Canadian example, when did residential schools close? The year we were born. Yeah. So it's in our lifetime. Hell yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Residential schools aren't f fully slavery, but they were. These kids were forced to go to these schools mm -hmm. against their will. Like these are all. These are all just tangents, evolutions of the form. Yes. Where you can talk about this slavery you know capitalism as an extension of slavery right <laughs> this idea of like wage slavery that's a or cool to thing. speak to all the boomers out there we're all slaves to our social media yeah and really, mobile like, devices I, I wouldn't go that far <laughs> no but it's just if yeah. they're gonna be ridiculous i'm gonna be ridiculous yeah yeah but no it, it's just this idea of like you're you're really the, the idea of a narrative is not just something that's exclusively written down, as we've talked about many times on the show, right? These narratives, yeah. as we've been alluding to throughout, are first and foremost oral, mm -hmm. and then they were written down. And that's something at least that Benjamin Drew demonstrates somewhat in transcribing these oral tales. But still, there's a by the very nature of the fact, there is a prevalence or an emphasis on the written word in this case. Right? The written word. Because the written word is all powerful and all knowing. It cannot be changed. <sighs> Except for versions 8 through 10 that have been edited by your scholastic resources. Yeah. Anyway, is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, I don't think so. Black Lives think... Matter, people. Yeah. Keep trying to look for... Again, we're, we're not the beginning of this conversation. We're not even part of this conversation. We are too due to our talking about literature. There are... We'll try and find some links, I think, to better sources to look at. Oh, yeah. I always put the sources for my research in the description. And that's what you should be reading. Ask mm -hmm. these questions. Dis disturb this Canadian myth of superiority, this quietness, the silence. Read oh up. Learn, learn what you can. S speaking of, like, weird silences. Okay. Do you want to hear, like, a really screwed up story? Do it. Uh, where my partner works, right? She works at a pet store, basically, like a pet supply store. Mm -hmm. And... She texted me a few weeks ago and she was like, hey, apparently it's dental hygiene month at Mondu. Okay. And I was like, what? And she's like, yep. They decided that February was dental hygiene month at Mondu. <sighs> and they put posters of it everywhere. And they're like really pushing this idea of it's dental month and teeth are healthy. It should be healthy. And you're like, are they just going to ignore Black History Month? That's some major propaganda right there. And you're like, oh my god. But like, I, and again, she brought it up with her bosses and they were like, huh, you're right. And then never did anything about it. But um, this idea of like just completely ignoring it, yeah. I don't, again, I don't think they did it with like an intently politicized idea in mind. I think it just points to the fact that people don't think about this stuff and they should, right? That's to, to, to me when you were saying like, oh, we're not even part of the conversation. I think just the fact that we're having this talk is indicative of certain changes, but mm -hmm. I see what you mean that like, this is something that goes way beyond just two guys doing a podcast. Right? Oh yeah, for sure. Again, like don't, 
don't use us as the exam as an example of anything really yeah is what i'm trying to say we're we don't speak for anybody we don't speak for anybody except ourselves and as as we will as we have stated before many times we share one brain cell between the two of us <laughs> and we're proud of that brain cell yes we take it for walks <laughs> no but I, I guess as a way of capping this all off Honestly, send us any questions. If you're a member of the Black Canadian community and you're listening to this show, please tell us what we can do better about it. Like, yeah, tell us. We, we, we all need to be willing to know what we do wrong and what we say that is wrong. And we, like every question or most of the questions that we get here, we will definitely feature it on the show and talk about it. All right. Well, that was, I think, a pretty good talk on you know, early Black writing in Canada. <laughs> Do you know what we're doing next episode, Mackenzie? What are we doing? We're finally getting into the 1840s and 1850s. Woo! Like, officially. We're not just sweeping like we did today over a f big period. We're actually, like, within the narrative, getting into the 1840s. We're finally out of 1830s Canada. Say what? Yeah. No way. The, the, I'm, I'm, I swear. You can tell your mom that we're finally moving past that. <laughs> And we're supposed to have a very special guest next episode, so stay tuned for that. Yay. In the meantime, as we mentioned, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach out through email, through Twitter, on the Facebook page. You can support the show through PayPal. There's the affiliate links for the recommended reading page. And you can find ad-free episodes and extra episodes through the Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Mm-hmm. And I'm just trying something out. I actually put some t-shirts up on Tee Public that represent some of the stuff we talked about on the show, and I find them silly and fun. So check that out if you want. If you want, like, a mug with the show's logo on it, go we have right a logo? ahead. Oh, yeah, we do have a logo. Like, the, the, the cover art of our show, if you will. Right. <laughs> because apparently I had nothing better to do on a Tuesday night. <laughs> so anyway all this is optional and the show will still remain free and independent if you choose not to hallelujah finally if you could leave a review on itunes and share it with some friends it would be very appreciated it helps boost the show and get it to more people's ears we're actually almost in the top 200 of the apple podcast history in canada so that's cool wait but like under the discussion topic of history in yes, canada under the topic of under the category of history podcasts on apple podcasts we're almost at the top 200 damn yeah. so just overall history though like not specifically canadian history overall history yo what i know i know <laughs> like we're, we're getting there we're getting there mac we're making like five dollars a month on patreon we're we're <laughs> look slowly. at me go ma <laughs> look ma no hands <laughs> Okay, I love that we're just doing all the jokes now at the very end once we've finished like, the I mean, really This is heavy where topic. they belong. <laughs> all right, for now, I'll just wish you all excellent health and hope that you and your loved ones can stay safe in these times. Yes. We'll see you next stay time. Stay safe, folks. On Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.